Um, so we might as well go ahead and get started. Are you ready, Shrim? Yeah. Okay. Um, so you're the host. You can you can share your screen. Um, so I want to thank everybody for showing up. Um, this is my first uh, online PhD defense. Um, I expect it'll run pretty much like a regular PhD defense, although um, I, I was looking forward to getting some donuts this morning. Uh, alas, uh, Shrim didn't bring me any donuts, so that's a, that's a demerit. That's, that's a joke. I don't expect the graduate student to bring me donuts at home. Um, but uh, so, you know, they could be delivered. <laughs> that's right. There could be a service to deliver donuts to, uh, to people on the committees before these defenses. Uh, anyway, let me say it's been a real pleasure working with Shrim over the last um, uh, almost, I guess, five and a half years. Uh, she arrived at Texas A&M in the fall of 2014 uh, after finishing her undergrad degree at uh, Nanjing University. Uh, and um, has been really working hard and doing good work for me since then. She wrote a paper from her master's thesis on looking at um, the seasonal cycle in stratospheric water vapor uh, in a model and um, in observations, compared to observations. Uh, and for her PhD work, which she's going to talk about here, um, she found a very interesting question about um, how stratospheric water vapor is going to change as the climate changes, uh, which is actually a, an important problem in, um, in, in climate science because it has big effects on ozone and climate and things like that. Um, and so uh, without further ado, I'll turn it over, I'll turn it over to her to... Um, uh, wow us with her work. Uh, thanks for the introduction. So can you see the screen I'm sharing right now, Dr. Desmond? Yes. Okay, that's yep. good. Okay, okay. Um, so welcome to my PhD defense. Uh, today let's talk about stratospheric water vapor and its response to different forcing agents. Uh, so why do we care about stratospheric water vapor? First, let's look at the zonal mean water vapor mixing ratio varying with latitude and pressure. And the black dashed line is the tropopause. We can see a lot of water vapor in the uh, troposphere below the tropopause and very little water vapor in the stratosphere. So why do we care about it? This is because it's an important greenhouse gas. It affects the radiative budget of the atmosphere. It is also uh, important for the regulation of stratospheric ozone. So why is there very little water vapor in the stratosphere? This is because air is transported from the troposphere to stratosphere following the brewer dobson circulation. So air goes upward in the tropics and then forward and downward at higher latitudes. And air uh, goes through the tropopause in the tropics it goes through this region with low temperatures indicated by the uh, temperature isentropes. And this region, uh, we call it the tropical tropopause layer, the TTL. As air goes through it, uh, water vapor condenses to the saturation mixing ratio uh, to, uh, corresponding to these low temperatures in the TTL. So basically, the TTL temperatures uh, determine the amount of water vapor that goes into the stratosphere. And uh, so we also noticed that the tropopause level varies with latitude. And so there are two special regions at higher latitudes. These regions are below the 380K isentropic surface, but above the tropopause level. And we noticed that the amount of water vapor in these uh, special regions are larger than that uh, at, in the stratosphere above the 380K surface. Uh, we call these regions the lowermost stratosphere. So why is there more water vapor in the lowermost stratosphere? This is because uh, in addition to the downward branch of the broad oxygen circulation, it is also contributed by multiple transport pathways, including uh, the hor quasi-horizontal transport from the tropical upper troposphere and also the vertical transport 
uh, from mid-latitude troposphere, such as convective transport. And uh, another thing I want to point out is the stratosphere above the 380k uh, isentropic surface, we call it the, the overworld stratosphere. So overall, the TTL temperatures are still the major factor that controls the budget of water vapor in the stratosphere. So if TTL temperatures change, the stratospheric water vapor will also change. And uh, for example, climate models under a scenario with increasing greenhouse gases predict that the TTL temperatures will increase over the 21st century. And correspondingly, it also predicts that the stratospheric water vapor will increase over the 21st century. And if we use the water vapor mixing ratio average over the last 10 years, minus that average over the first 10 years, and we do a difference uh, between the two decades, this difference is the total stratospheric water vapor response. And we can actually split it into two components. One is the fast adjustment, and the other is the slow response. So why do we need to split it and which component is more important, the fast adjustment or the slow response? And to explain that, we need to first look at the vertical profile of the atmospheric temperature. We see that the temperature decreases with altitude in the troposphere and then increases with altitude in the stratosphere. And suppose we abruptly double carbon dioxide in the entire atmosphere. And on a shorter time scale, the surface temperature does not change since uh, the surface is mostly covered by ocean and it has a large heat content. So, so it takes a lo much longer time for the surface to respond. And the adiabatic lapse rate ties the tropospheric temperature to the surface temperature. So the tropospheric temperature does not change much. However, in the stratosphere, since we have more carbon dioxide in the entire atmosphere, uh, the emissivity of the air increases. That means the stratosphere will emit more long wave radiation back to space. And that results in a cooling in the stratosphere indicated by the dashed line. And our focus is on stratospheric water vapor. And that uh, leads us back to the TTL region indicated by the red box. And we zoom in. So we see that this dash line is uh, the new temperature profile. There's a cooling up here in the stratosphere. However, at uh, the level at 100 millibar, which is close to the tropopause level, we see a tiny increase of temperature there. And this tiny increase of temperature in the TTL will, will result in a tiny increase in stratospheric water vapor. But you might remember uh, at the beginning, I showed you this trend over 21st century, and the TTL temperature increase was about 2 Kelvin. And it was large compared to this tiny increase. And the stratospheric water vapor response was also larger. So why is that? That's because we're talking about the fast, uh, fast adjustment. That's, that's this component here. And uh, this component occurs before the surface temperature changes. And previous studies also show that when we increase carbon dioxide, the fast adjustment of stratospheric water vapor and TTL temperature is small. And once the surface temperature changes, there is more to come. So suppose given sufficient time, the surface temperature increases and the tropospheric temperature follows the surface temperature also increases. We see this dash line here. And we go back to the TTL region and zoom in again. Uh, this dash line is the fast adjustment we just talked about. And this dash line on the right hand side is the new temperature profile. We see an increase of temperature at 100 millibar of about 2 Kelvin. So in this uh, process, the surface temperature increases. As a result, the TTL temperature increases. And, and, and as, as, as a result, the stratospheric water vapor increases. So this process is the slow response. It occurs uh, when the surface temperature changes. And previous studies also show that when we carbon, uh, increase carbon dioxide, the slow response of stratospheric water vapor is larger and plays a dominant role. So our diagram and previous studies all show that when we increase carbon dioxide, the total stratospheric water vapor can be split into the fast adjustment and slow response. The fast adjustment 
is less important and the slow response plays a more dominant role. And since it occurs when the surface temperature changes, that indicates there is a connection between a major part of the total response and the surface temperature change. And an easy way to quantify the relationship between the two is to do a regression. And previous studies has done this regression. This is a figure from Banerjee et al, 2019. They regressed the annual mean uh, stratospheric water vapor response time series data against the surface temperature change time series data. And they did this regression using a climate model uh, abruptly perturbed by quadruple carbon dioxide. They showed that there is a passive correlation between the two time series data. And not only that, they used a group of models and did the same regression. And they all show the same conclusion that there is passive correlation between stratospheric water vapor response and the surface temperature change. And this passive correlation is important since it tells us when surface warms, we get more stratospheric water vapor. And um, since it's a greenhouse gas, it means a warming surface. And that's a passive climate feedback. A passive climate feedback is important since it amplifies the climate forcing. However, this is only true when we uh, increase carbon dioxide. We don't know if the climate is perturbed by some forcing agents with different uh, physical properties, how the stratospheric water vapor responds. And different climate forcing agents uh, may result in different patterns of climate change. For example, black carbon, it comes from uh, fossil fuel combustion and biomass burning and is emitted over continents and widely spread in the atmosphere. It is dark, so it absorbs shortwave radiation and it heats the atmosphere. And since shortwave radiation is absorbed in the air, less is transmitted to the surface, so it, it results in the surface dimming. And this pattern is very different from that uh, forced by carbon dioxide. So we want to know if the climate is perturbed by something like this, how does stratospheric water vapor respond? Uh, does it still have a larger slow response or how does it respond to surface temperature change? And here are some key questions. First, what are the magnitudes of fast and slow responses in stratospheric water vapor when forced by different forcing agents? And second, when forced by different forcing agents, which is more important, the slow or the fast response? And third, how does the stratospheric water vapor respond to surface temperature change when the climate is perturbed by different forcing agents? And finally, what drives the fast response? Are the relationships robust across different forcing agents and models? And to answer this question, uh, we use nine climate models. And the, each, each of these models have a baseline simulation uh, so in the baseline, the, uh, the solar constant and greenhouse gases, forcings, etc., are at present day level or pre-industrial level. And each of these models have five to 10 perturbed simulations. These perturbations are abrupt on a global scale and they are relative to the baseline. So if we triple methane, that means we three times the methane in baseline. And each of these simulations have uh, two configurations. One is the fixed SST run, which runs for 15 years, and the other is the fully coupled run, which runs for 100 years. And we are going to use these model runs to compute the stratospheric water vapor response and split it into the fast adjustment and slow response. And first, we compute the total stratospheric water vapor response, and we need to use the fully coupled run. In this figure, the uh, red line is the water vapor mixing ratio uh, annual mean time series from the coupled perturbed simulation. In this case, double carbon dioxide experiment. And we see there is a positive trend there. And the blue line is the water vapor uh, time series from coupled baseline simulation. Since there is no perturbation, we don't see any trend in the blue line. To compute the total response, we simply use the red line minus the blue line and we get a time series of the total stratospheric water vapor response. And then we compute the fast adjustment. Since the fast adjustment occurs before the surface temperature changes, we need to use the fixed SST run. 
and the blue line is the time series from the fixed SST baseline simulation. And the orange line is the uh, time series, water vapor time series from the fixed SST perturbed simulation. In this case, still double carbon dioxide. And to compute uh, the first adjustment, we simply use the orange line minus the blue line. And since for the first adjustment, we don't need uh, a time series, we only use uh, need values averaged over the last 10 years. And then we compute the slow response. Since the total response is the sum of the two components, to get the slow response, we simply subtract the first adjustment from the total response. And by doing this subtraction, we get a time series of the, total, uh, of the slow response. However, only getting a time series of the slow response is not enough. Since uh, climate, we also need to know the values uh, at an equilibrium climate state. And however, models often do not reach an equilibrium climate state at the end of a 100-year run. So if we look at the net downward radiative flux at top, uh, at top of atmosphere, uh, it is a metric to show how close the climate system is to an equilibrium climate state. So we see that the time series begins from about 3.5 watts per square meter. And this is caused by the double carbon dioxide. And then it decreases because the climate system responds to it and it should decre decrease towards zero. If it is zero, that means the climate system is at an equilibrium state. However, at the end of year 100, we see that R is still above zero. That means the climate system is still not at an equilibrium state. And at the same time, the stratospheric water vapor response time series looks like this. It begins from zero and then it increases because there is an imbalance in the climate system. And at the, year, uh, at the end of year 100, this value is still not the value at an equi equilibrium state because R is still above zero. However, we can use the relationship between the decreasing R and the increasing stratospheric water vapor response. We can extend the R data towards zero and at the same time extend stratospheric water vapor response toward the equilibrium value. And to do this, we first use an exponential function to fit the two time series data and get a smoothed data indicated by the dashed lines. And then we do a regression so we regress the smooth R against the smooth stratospheric water vapor response and show the scatter plot here. We see R decreases as stratospheric water vapor response increases. And then we do a regression. So we extend the data toward R equals to zero and find this interception. This interception is the equilibrium stratospheric water vapor response we need. However, we notice that uh, the relationship between the two time series data is not linear over the entire 100 year run period. So we only use data, smoothed data over the last 30 years and do this regression and find the interception at R equals to zero. And to get the equilibrium slow response, we simply subtract the first adjustment from the equilibrium uh, total response. And that's all for um, introduction. Now we talk about results. So first, we need to get familiar with these different forcing agents. We want to know what kind of uh, climate perturbation does each of these forcing agents bring about. And the effective radiative forcing is an uh, important quantity to evaluate uh, climate perturbation caused by forcing agents. And uh, it's the net downward radiative flux in the perturbed atmosphere minus that in the baseline atmosphere and we compute it using the fixed SS theorem. First we show the effective radiative forcing from double carbon dioxide and we sh at first we show it for one model only. We show the Zonomin result. We see that the effective radiative forcing is larger in the tropics than at higher latitudes. This is because if we increase carbon dioxide in the entire atmosphere it absorbs more long wave radiation from the tropics since the tropics is warmer. And then we show the results from all climate models. The different color uh, indicate different results from uh, models. And we see that these models show general agreement uh, uh, in the latitudinal pattern and also magnitude. 
And then we show the result from all climate perturbations. So in this figure, each panel is a result from a climate perturbation, and the color of the lines are results from different models. Hey, we see that, yeah, yes? I think it'd, it'd be useful um, to explain in words what effective radiative forcing is and how you calculated it for people that don't live and breathe it. Okay. Uh, effective radiative forcing is the net downward radiative flux um, in, at the top of atmosphere. And uh, we computed using the effective, uh, the radiative flux in the perturbed atmosphere. So if we double carbon dioxide and minus that in the baseline atmosphere. Is it clear? Yeah, it's before the surface temperatures changed. It's yeah, before the surface change, change in TOA flux after you've perturbed it, but before the surface temperature changes. Kind of like the fast adjustment. In fact, it's a real parallel to the fast adjustment in water vapor. Yeah. Um, okay. Sorry. Okay. okay. So this uh, is zone mean effective rate radiative forcing from all different climate perturbations. And uh, we noticed that for greenhouse gases, the, the forcing agents that are greenhouse gases, such as carbon dioxide, uh, methane, and um, CFCs, N2O, we see larger effective radiative forcing in the tropics um, and uh, a smaller effective radiative forcing at higher latitudes. So they uh, show similar uh, latitudinal pattern. That's because they are greenhouse gases and they're based on same mechanisms. However, for forcing agents that are aerosols, such as black carbon sulfate and black carbon with shorter lifetime, we see a larger forcing in the northern hemisphere. This is because the, the aerosols are mostly emitted over uh, continents, and there are more continents in the northern hemisphere. And then we want to compare the magnitude of uh, ERF across these different climate perturbations. And to do that, we show the global average uh, effective radiative forcing and compare it. So in this figure, each column is the ERF from a climate perturbation. And the marker shapes are results from different models. Solid black circles are ensemble average and whiskers are uh, error bars. We focus on the ensemble average and error bars. We see there is a large uh, variability across different climate perturbations in the magnitude of the effective radiative forcing. And this can cause a problem since we want to compare the stratospheric water vapor response from different climate perturbations. And uh, for example, if we focus on these two experiments, the double carbon dioxide and triple methane, we see that double carbon dioxide has a larger forcing. And suppose we compare stratospheric water vapor response from these two experiments. And suppose the response is larger in the double carbon dioxide experiment. So what does it mean? Is it simply because the, um, because the forcing in this experiment is larger and it uh, results in a larger response, or it is because the water vapor in this experiment is more sensitive to this, uh, this particular forcing? We don't know the answer. So to solve this problem, we need to normalize the stratospheric water vapor response by, uh, divided by the ERF. So we, we, we will compare this normalized value across different climate perturbations. And the differences in the ERF itself won't confound our results. And um, now we look at the slow response. So first we show the zonal mean equilibrium slow response normalized by ERF. We show it for double carbon dioxide experiment and this Since the slow response is normalized by ERF, we see that the unit of the color bar is ppmv per watts per square meter. And the light blue line is the tropopause. We see that uh, because of the double carbon dioxide, the entire stratosphere is uh, going to be moistened. And there is a large vertical gradient close to the tropopause level. And another way to show the same data is we show the slow response uh, relative relative to, to the baseline in percentage change. And uh, we see clearly that in the tropical upper troposphere, the slow response is largest. And then as we go upward into the stratosphere, the slow response decreases with altitude in the, the overworld stratosphere. 
However, at higher latitudes in the lowermost stratosphere, the slow response is larger than that in the uh, overworld. This is because of the different transport pathways in the lowermost stratosphere. And uh, the, the slow response is also larger in the northern hemisphere than the southern hemisphere. This is because transport is stronger in the northern hemisphere. And then we want to compare this, uh, this slow response across different climate perturbations. And instead of showing a zonal mean plot like this, which is hard to compare, we only use values averaged at selected regions. So the first region we care about is the tropical lower stratosphere. So we use values averaged at 70 millibar between 30 degrees south and north. And the second region we care about is the lowermost stratosphere. We use values averaged at 200 millibar between 50 to 90 degrees. And we uh, do this for both the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere. So we are going to use values averaged at these three regions separately and then uh, compare them across different climate perturbations. So here's the result for tropical lower stratosphere. We show, uh, we show the equilibrium slow response normalized by ERF. And in this figure, each column is the result from a climate perturbation. Marker shapes in gray are results from different models, solid black circles ensemble average, and these are error bars. We focus on the ensemble average and error bars we see that uh, the slow response, the magnitude of the slow response, show general agreement across these different climate perturbations. And um, we also want to know how much the slow response contributes to the total response. So we do this ratio of uh, equilibrium slow response divided by equilibrium total response and show in percentage. We see that for most climate perturbations, uh, the slow response contributes to more than 50% of the total response. And some of them even show close to 100% contribution. And however, for other experiments, for example, 10 times black carbon, it shows very small contribution from the slow response. And we'll talk about that later. And then we look at the uh, lowermost stratosphere, first in the northern hemisphere it basically shows the same conclusion that the magnitude of the slow response have general agreement across different uh, climate perturbations. And uh, also it has larger contribution, uh, larger than 50% contribution to the slow response, uh, to the total response. Uh, some of them even show close to 100%. And similar conclusion from the southern hemisphere. So our result shows that uh, the slow response Contributes to uh, contributes more to the slow uh, to the total response and it plays a dominant role. And um, so, since slow response occurs when the surface temperature changes, so that means there is a connection between the two data. And recall this figure from previous study. And in this fig uh, in this section, we are going to explore the slow response uh, and the surface temperature change and the relationship between the two. So first, we do a regression using the annual mean uh, slow response time series data against the annual mean surface temperature change time series data. And we show the result for double carbon dioxide only. In this figure, each panel is the regression from a climate model. And these models show passive correlation uh, between the two time series data. For these regressions, there is one value that we really care about. That's the slope of the regression. So for example, for CAM4, the slope of uh, the regression is 0.26 PBMV per Kelvin. That means the slow response is 0.26 PBMV when the surface warms by one degree. And that's the sensitivity of the slow response to surface temperature change. So we want to know, uh, we want to compare this sensitivity value across different climate perturbations. We want to know if the climate is perturbed by different forcing agents, does the sensitivity change or is the sensitivity the same? And um, so to answer that question, we are not going to show a scatter plot like this for all the different climate perturbations. We're only going to show the slope and compare it. So first for the tropical lower stratosphere, uh, each column is the sensitivity from a climate perturbation and marker shapes are models. These solar circles are ensemble average. 
If we focus on the ensemble average and error bars, we see that uh, the sensitivity of slow uh, response to surface temperature change uh, have general agreement across different climate perturbations. And the ensemble average value is 0.35 ppmb per degree of surface warming. And this is very important since it tells us when the climate is perturbed by different forcing agents, even if the climate has a, a different pattern uh, climate change, we still have similar sensitivity in stratospheric water vapor to surface temperature change. And, uh, and then we look at the sensitivity of water vapor in the lowermost stratosphere. So it basically shows the same conclusion that the sensitivity of water vapor in this region has similar sensitivity to surface temperature change across these different climate perturbations. And this value is 2.1 ppmv per Kelvin in the northern hemisphere and 0.97 in the southern hemisphere. We also notice that this sensitivity value is larger than that in the uh, tropical lower stratosphere. So that means there is a larger sensitivity of water vapor in the lowermost stratosphere. And actually we can get a much clearer picture in this figure. So we repeated the regression for water vapor at each zonal mean grid point and show the slope at, at each zonal mean grid point. And we see that the water vapor is most sensitive to surface temperature change uh, in the tropical upper troposphere. And then as we go upwards into the stratosphere, the sensitivity decreases with altitude in the tropical overworld. <clears throat> and then we uh, look at the lowermost stratosphere at higher latitudes we see that the sensitivity is larger than that in the overworld because of the different transport pathways. And also the sensitivity is larger in the northern hemisphere. And finally, we look at the fast response. So again, we compare the fast response normalized by the ERF across different climate perturbations. And uh, so we see that there is a large variability in the magnitude of the fast response across different climate perturbations. And we also want to know how much the fast response contributes to the total uh, equilibrium response. And we see that there is also a large variability across different climate perturbations. At uh, first, let's talk about this fast adjustment from double carbon dioxide. We see that it is close to zero, and it also has a close to zero contribution to the total response. So recall that we talked about the TTL temperatures. We, sh we show that it is the major factor that controls the amount of water vapor that enters the stratosphere. So now we're talking about the fast adjustment of stratosphere, ferric water vapor. And uh, so we also want to know the fast adjustment of temperature in the TTL. So recall this, temp uh, this diagram I showed you at the beginning. This solid black line is the temperature in the baseline as atmosphere, so before any climate perturbation. And this dashed line is the temperature profile from the perturbed atmosphere, so with double carbon dioxide, but before the surface temperature changes. And if we uh, do a difference between the perturbed temperature and the baseline temperature, we get uh, this difference. This difference is the temperature fast adjustment. And we want to uh, look at its vertical profile in the TTL region. So here's the vertical profile of temperature fast adjustment. The blue line is the result from double carbon dioxide. We see that in the tropopause region, the temperature fast adjustment is close to zero. And that's why we have a close to zero fast adjustment in stratospheric water vapor. And another type of fast adjustment uh, is this from 10 times black carbon. It has a much larger magnitude than any other climate perturbation and also has a larger contribution to the total response, even close to 100%. And if we look at the vertical profile of temperature fast adjustment, we see this red line. <clears throat> there is a large heating uh, in the tropopause region. That's because the black carbon absorbs shortwave radiation and it directly heats the TTL region, does not need any, med any mediation from the surface. And in fact, if we look at the vertical profile of temperature fast adjustment from all these different climate perturbations, we see that some other forcing agents also directly heat the TTL region, but not as strong as the 10 times black carbon. For example, five times ozone, the yellow line, 
So tropospheric ozone also absorbs shortwave radiation in the TTL region, so it directly heats the TTL. And for example, these the pink and black black line. So that they are from 10 times CFC 12 and 11. So CFCs absorb long wave radiation in the in the atmospheric window range. So they can uh, uh, directly heat the TTL region. And also this uh, light blue and orange line. So they are 10 times like carbon with short lifetime and triple methane. So these forcing agents also absorb short wave radiation. So it results in the heating. So as long as the TTL region is heated, we get a positive uh, response, uh, fast adjustment in stratospheric water vapor. And also um, a close to 50% or even more than 50% contribution to the total response. So that's all for the tropical lower stratosphere. Now we uh, look at the lowermost stratosphere. So we see that for the lowermost stratosphere, uh, for most climate perturbations, the fast adjustment is close to zero and have, has smaller contribution to the total response, except for 10 times black carbon, which has a larger magnitude than most other uh, climate perturbations. So uh, our result clearly showed that the fast adjustment of stratospheric water vapor in the tropical lower stratosphere is closely related to the TTL temperature fast adjustment. And to quantitatively show that, we do a regression between the tropical lower stratospheric water vapor uh, fast adjustment against the cold point temperature fast adjustment. So we do this regression across all these different climate perturbations and models. So colors indicate uh, different climate perturbations. We see that these uh, points all fall onto the same line with a slope of 0.52 ppmb per Kelvin of cold point temperature change. So cold point temperature is the minimum temperature on a temperature profile uh, at a horizontal grid. So uh, this relationship is close to the clausius clapeyron relationship, close to the tropopause level. And this relationship is robust across all these different climate perturbations and models. And uh, that's all. Uh, now conclusions. So first, for, climate perturbation, uh, for most climate perturbations, the slow response dominates the total response and the fast adjustment is less important. But when the forcing agent radiatively heats the cold point region, uh, for example, black carbon, the fast adjustment is more important. And second, the slow response exhibits a similar sensitivity to surface temperature change across all climate perturbations and the values in the tropical lower stratosphere and lowermost stratosphere are listed here. And finally, the fast adjustment in the tropical lower stratosphere is driven by the fast adjustment of cold, cold point temperature. And this relationship is robust across different forcing agents and models. And uh, finally, I'd like to thank my uh, advisor, Dr. Dessler, for supporting my PhD research and studies and helping me with writing and uh, presentation. And I'd like, also like to thank my committee, Dr. Bowman, Dr. NG, and Dr. North for giving me helpful discussion after my prelim. And I'd also like to thank people in my research group, especially Wendy. She's a good friend and a good colleague. Thank you. That's all. I can take questions from here.